Hello, everybody, and welcome to the University of Texas at Austin Center for Subsurface Energy and Environment monthly webinar. We do this every Tuesday at noon, every second Tuesday of the month, and we're glad to have Silvio Levescu, and I'll introduce him in a second. Myself, um, I'm a member of the Center for Subsurface and Energy and Environment. Along with me, we here at the University of Texas at Austin, we have 26 faculty and PIs. Here's pictures of all our smiling faces. And we all work on subsurface energy, um, how, to um, how to move things through the subsurface, how things are moved through the subsurface. Um, here we can break up with some things that we do. We break them up into applications, disciplines, and engineering tools. Um, big thing of our applications are things like carbon core capture, utilization, and storage, conventional oil and gas, tight oil and gas, methane hydrates, things like this. Geothermal is what we're going to be talking about today with Sylvia Levescu. Um, we have technical disciplines, uh, reservoir engineering, data analytics, uh, petrophysics, things like that are big strong ones. And engineering tools are, are basically the tools we help develop for the industry to move everything forward. Uh, we interact a lot with industry and we're interested in questions and answers for the talk today. The main way is through our in industrial affiliate program. Um, there's a whole bunch of them listed here on the screen. So today's monthly webinar, we do these again every month. They're informative and industry driven webinars from problems that we see in industry by researchers and collaborators here at CSEE. Again, we're doing these the se second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams as we're doing it right now. Um, all these webinars are load, uploaded to our YouTube channel within a few days after doing this. If you happen to miss in the live event or if you want to come next month and you miss the live event, you can always get it um, on the YouTube a couple days later. Pepper any question and answers a couple days later though. Um, so let's talk about our upcoming coming webinars. July 11th, we have Dr. Hugh Daigle um, from CSEE. That's my birthday. I'll be on vacation. I won't watch it, but I'll watch it later. Won't watch it live. Um, August 8th. Hey, that's me. I will be the presenter in August. Looking forward to seeing you all. And on September 12th, we have Dr. Larry Lake. Those are upcoming webinars. So a little things, um, uh, housekeeping business here. When you have a question, you can just post it in the question and answer section. Um, it will just stay there and wait till uh, Dr. Levescu is done with his talk. And then he can look through all the questions and answer them as as um, as they come up or at, basically as he reads them and you can refer back to the parts of the talk. So you don't have to think about saving to the end. You can just write them as is and we'll just look at them at the end. OK, and we'll he'll answer them at the completion of today's presentation. Again, our talk today, we're very pleased to have Dr. Silvio Levescu. Dr. Levescu um, <coughs> has a long history in working in subsurface energy. Uh, he's recently come to us from Baker Hughes and right now a big thing about Dr. Levescu is he's basically the, the data science and engineering analytics director on the board of the directors of the Society of Petroleum Engineers or SPE International. So we're, we're happy he does that and we're happy we've had him for the last three or four years here. He's published over 100 papers and articles. Um, a big thing he's interested in production and making sure things come to the surface the right way, other ways of using subsurface energy. So today's talk, as you can see from his title, is geothermal beyond power generation. And this is kind of interesting to me because people always talk about power generation, but there's other things in geothermal. He's going to be talking about how you can use that to do direct air capture using this geothermal energy. With that, I'm going to throw you over to Dr. Silvio, Le Silvio Levescu, um, and it will be a very interesting talk. All right. Um, thank you very much, David, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I cannot see how many people are attending or I cannot see your names, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, uh, send them, uh, uh, type them, and I'll try to answer them uh, after the end of my talk. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm targeting to talk about 40 minutes uh, and then and then I'm, I'm open for questions. Uh, of course, uh, you can find me on the internet. So if you have more questions, just just send me an email or, or uh, uh, contact me. Otherwise, uh, today talk is about uh, uh, geothermal energy in uh, in general and in particular about direct air capture. Uh, 
However, I'm, I'm going to give an overview about uh, where the state of the industry is right now uh, and, and what's happening in geothermal and, and also at UT. Um, Today's talk is uh, it's based on, on, on recent papers that uh, uh, two of, uh, of our uh, uh, great PhD students, uh, Timur and Kivan, uh, together with me have, have written. Uh, so, so I hope you can find this interesting. Um, so uh, in general, why geothermal, right? So uh, geothermal has been around for, for many, many years, decades or even centuries, as you know very well. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that many are already familiar with, with uh, geothermal energy. Uh, and, and I hope that everybody knows already that, uh, you know, the, the core of our planet is as hot as the sun, but of course it's much closer. Uh, a, a very interesting piece of trivia is that 99% of the Earth uh, it's, it's hotter than 1000 degrees Celsius and, and uh, only 0.1% uh, is colder than 100 degrees. Um, and so geothermal is renewable because it's, it's, a, it's a heat that is continuously produced inside our planet. Um, and also it's clean, it's, it's always on, so it's not weather dependent, it's, it's base load, uh, how I'm sure many of you ha have heard already. And it's, it's, it's literally available everywhere on Earth. Um, and so because of all these advantages, uh, you know, uh, geothermal is, is such a promising energy source. Uh, now, uh, in the last, you know, uh, the discussion about geothermal has been um, uh, heated up, um, no pun intended uh, or pun intended, or whatever you want to, uh, to interpret it. Uh, it's, you know, the discussion has really come up about geothermal really, really strongly in the last, uh, you know, three years, I would say from 2020, especially, and I'm going to explain why. But but um, for many people I talk with, uh, engineers or non-engineers, you know, when, when, when you say geothermal, everybody is thinking about power generation. Um, and everybody is imagining, you know, the hydrothermal resources that you have in California, the, uh, the geysers, you have Yellowstone uh, or other parts in, in, in the world like Iceland, Philippines, um, uh, Italy and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but but um, commercially, uh, what I want to say is that geothermal is not only about power generation, and as you are going to see uh, uh, in a few slides, but but uh, the, the technology is available for hydrothermal resources, so for power generation from hydrothermal resources along the ring of fire, or for direct heat applications such as heating and cooling of buildings, uh, are mature and commercially available technologies today. However, I'm going to make the case later that, you know, there are many other applications of geothermal energy as we are going to see. Um, and so why geothermal now? So, as I said, uh, especially for hydrothermal uh, uh, resources and for direct heat applications for building, heating and cooling, the technologies are available and commercially available today. Um, in 2006, uh, there was a report from MIT and, and uh, uh, the Idaho National uh, Lab um, picturing a future about geothermal resources using especially enhanced geothermal systems. And so in 2019, uh, the Department of Energy in US through uh, the Geothermal uh, Technologies Office also came up with ge the Geovision report. Uh, that was 2019 and it was a great report with a lot of, you know, um, uh, predictions and, and vision about the future in geothermal. However, in my opinion, what really um, changed the entire narrative about geothermal was was Jamie Beard, who at the University of Texas in Austin in, in 2020 started the Geothermal Entrepreneurship um, Organization, or GEO in short, with funding from the Department of Energy to attract startups in geothermal and and uh, and uh, 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 take care of uh, of the uh, technology development and deployment. Uh, Jamie also in in 2021 gave a TED talk um, associated with the uh, COP26 in Glasgow, in which her whole team was that in order to make geothermal, which is such a massive energy source, uh, in order to make it um, uh, uh, an alternative, um, a good uh, solution for the energy, uh, you know, diversification we need, um, 
was to attract the oil and gas uh, industry into geothermal. And so recently this year she gave a, a uh, she has an article in, in Wired about exactly the same thing and her, uh, her journey through uh, geothermal. Uh, she created a project in her space, uh, who now has a really great team and really great initiatives about geothermal development. Um, and, and so also in January this year, after 15 years of, uh, of uh, 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 writing, uh, more than 100 people published the future of geothermal in Texas report that was uh, has been really well received is available from the energy institute at the university of texas in austin uh, website uh, i was a, a, a lead author on on five of the uh, 15 uh, chapters of of that report uh, which is pretty long, 360 pages, but but uh, executive summary, it's only 11 pages. It's a really great read and I uh, strongly recommend uh, uh, everybody to take a look. Uh, but continuing the story about why geothermal now, uh, all these efforts culminated in, in geod. So last year, the US Department of Energy um, announced uh, a funding opportunity called geothermal energy from oil and gas demonstrated engineering or geod in short. And so last, uh, uh, Jamie through project uh, Inner Space uh, approached me um, last summer and, and so we started to brainstorm how how to bring SP, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, into into this um, uh, funding opportunity. And so uh, in in October last year, I uh, I uh, and John Boden, uh, the vice president uh, for everything technical in, in SP, uh, went to the board, uh, board of directors of SP and proposed for the very first time for SPE to actually be part of such a consortium to apply for uh, Department of Energy funding. And if you think about it, this is an absolutely great initiative because it's exactly what SPE does. So talking about uh, technology road mapping, talking about uh, uh, disseminating information, uh, bringing professionals together to share information and, and to train, uh, all that is perfect for SPE. And so together with Project Inner Space, SPE and Geothermal Rising, which is the, the, um, the geothermal organization in the US, um, we uh, together applied. And then since then, uh, with Jamie, with uh, Brian Jones, who is uh, the, the executive director for, for Geothermal Rising, and Tim Lines uh, from SP, uh, we had, and, and then many other volunteers, we had a really strong team to, to write the proposal together, to uh, answer all the reviewers' questions and um, uh, to, to go back and forth negotiating with the Department of Energy, which is still currently uh, ongoing. Um, a lot of weekends, a lot of evenings, a lot of work has put uh, in, into this initiative already, um, hundreds of hours. Um, however, uh, as I said, the potential is absolutely amazing. Just thinking about how many professionals from SPE and Geothermal Rising are going to get involved into this entire um, uh, process. So now talking about um, talking about geothermal applications, uh, what is truly interesting is that you know the entire discussion is uh, um, uh, it also recently um, when when you go with national laws, when you talk with you know universities, when you talk with many companies actually oil and gas companies, everybody is really interested in power generation, right? So um, however, on the picture on the right here, uh, what you see from uh, from um, uh, the uh, the geovision report, uh, DOA's report since 2019, is that on the left, that's power generation, depending on different temperatures that we can extract the heat um, uh, from. But then on the right uh, side, there are many, many uh, direct heat applications in which actually heat is produced from the, the subsurface, brought to the surface, and then is used directly um, as heat. And so that can be direct heating applications for buildings, so heating and cooling of buildings, but can be anything, um, including agriculture, uh, even hydrogen production, right? So a lot of different uh, different applications and direct air uh, uh, capture like, like uh, uh, today's uh, uh, topic. Um, and so this comes uh, from, from DOE. The picture from the left, and uh, this is something that uh, you can Google and find from many other countries. This comes from Australia, 
but uh, my my country uh, Canada has has similar you know uh, diagrams. Uh, many countries in Europe have different kind of. Uh, um, uh, tables. Um, so pretty much now all countries are starting to look into what it means to produce geothermal energy, not only along from Ring of Fire, the hydrothermal applications that are um, uh, very well understood, but but also anywhere in the world in places like Texas, where uh, where I am now in Austin. Um, and so uh, what what I want also to comment on is that related to the Geovision report from DOE since 2019, here are two pictures actually that you can find in the, in the report on the website. Um, and so the picture from the left shows the geothermal opportunities uh, for uh, power generation, so for electric production. And so we are in you know when the report came out it was 2019 so you can see where 2020 is at that time you know the the um, uh, capacity the electric capacity was you know uh, let's say four or five uh, gigawatts electric um, they are predicting that uh, by 2050 uh, that will increase uh, to 60 um, gigawatts, so pretty much uh, 26 times more than it was in 2019. Um, just recently, uh, this year, the Department of Energy came up with uh, the enhanced geothermal shot um, and they updated these uh, uh, numbers to 90 gigawatts electric by uh, 2050. So an, in uh, an exponential increase in, in electric capacity. And so what that means is not only the electrical capacity, but, but for instance, in terms of decarbonization, um, with the current number that you see here for uh, 60 gigawatts electric by 2050, uh, that would mean uh, half of um, giga uh, metric tons of uh, um, equivalent uh, CO2 emissions um, um, removed. Uh, and that's equivalent to 6 million cars per year removed um, uh, you know, um, uh, from, from the roads. And so that's for electric power generation, the, the picture from the left. The picture from the right, what it shows here is uh, heating and cooling um, uh, uh, systems for buildings. And so the same thing, uh, very, uh, very impressive numbers, uh, 28 million households uh, by 2050 having geothermal heat pumps uh, and also more than 15,000 um, uh, district uh, networks, district heating networks in United States alone. But in order to compare the power generation and the direct heat applications from the GeoVision report, uh, the way I want to look at that uh, is, the, is the carbon um, uh, CO2 equivalent emissions removed. So for power generation is half a billion for um, uh, for for heating and cooling applications is more than one billion, right? So um, the in terms of car um, cars removed from the road for power generation is six million, and for uh, heating and, and and cooling applications is twenty million. So by all means, what this shows us is actually the impact on direct heating applications. Uh, on on uh, on um, on um, uh, emissions reduction, sorry, is is really that the the direct heat applications have a much uh, stronger impact, right? Uh, and this is, comes just from the GeoVision report. Now, when we talk about uh, other reports, um, also uh, what I want to bring to your attention is that for global power generation, right now we have probably uh, around fifteen thousand hydrothermal wells in operation today, um, and, and that compares to 2 million active oil and gas wells. For global district heat applications, uh, the yearly market has increased from around 70 uh, in 2000 uh, to around 540 in 2022. And so, what that shows us, when you put all these numbers together, what this shows us is that there are absolutely amazing opportunities for the oil and gas professionals to come into geothermal and figure out how actually we can scale up the, uh, the geothermal systems for both power generation and for direct heat applications.
Now, I also have a, um, um, a figure here from, from the class I'm teaching at UT on geothermal engineering. Um, so what this shows is actually the, the global greenhouse gas emissions by sector. Uh, and, and so energy usage is, is by far uh, the predominant uh, uh, greenhouse uh, emission sector uh, in the world. But what is absolutely interesting on this one is that transportation, which is, you know, everybody's talking about electrifying uh, transportation, that one by itself, it's less than all the buildings, uh, uh, building sector. So again, if you think about the numbers I talked earlier, power generation and direct heat applications for buildings, and what we are seeing here again in terms of emissions is by far, uh, we can make a much faster, much stronger impact with direct heat applications for, for buildings. So district heating uh, networks, uh, thermal storage, and, uh, and uh, uh, heating and cooling uh, 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 geothermal heat pumps. Um, this is something that, that I like to think from, you know, as a big picture, when we are defining the problem we are trying to solve, right? Um, and so now I mentioned the, the future of geothermal in Texas report that uh, uh, Jamie uh, uh, started. Um, and so uh, for, for the oil and gas professionals out there, what, what is very interesting to, to uh, think about is that when we compare the renewable energy sources, when we talk about solar, wind and geothermal, uh, by far geothermal, um, because it doesn't depend on the weather, has the largest uh, capacity factor, right? So it's uh, more than 90%. Uh, different sources can save a 95%, right? So that's way, way more than than what wind and solar can uh, can uh, can bring with their uh, intermittencies. In terms of comparing the surface uh, footprint of geothermal, again, is by far the the most um, uh, the most uh, uh, yeah. convenient uh, technology. And also, if we can make it work anywhere in sedimentary basins, in all our geothermal, uh, in all our oil and gas, you know, fields, um, or or anywhere in the world, just because we are using for direct heat applications and we don't need to drill that uh, that deep, uh, this already it's it's a absolutely uh, great um, selling point, commercial point. Um, and so another thing I wanted to to say for the oil and gas professional from uh, from our report is that. Um, as part of of the um, or of the uh, future of geothermal in Texas report, I uh, I show on the on the previous slide, we ran a survey in between May uh, March and June 2022 with 14 oil and gas uh, uh, majors and and the geothermal company and and we asked them a lot of questions about you know uh, the R and D plans, the interest in geothermal, uh, the interest in you know different. Um, different geothermal technologies such as enhanced geothermal systems or advanced geothermal systems or um, or the technology readiness for whatever they are doing uh, in terms of permitting regulatory framework, um, everything, right? And, and that's very well um, uh, described in, in, uh, in a chapter uh, in the report. So I encourage all of you interested in this kind of uh, um, results to, to, to take a look. But, but for the sake of, uh, of this uh, presentation, what I want to say is that um, um, I'm, I'm showing here the results only for four questions, right? So um, are you interested in enhanced geothermal systems? Are you interested in uh, advanced geothermal systems? Are you interested in uh, reusing oil and gas uh, wells for, uh, for geothermal uh, uh, use? And uh, are you interested in direct use uh, heating and cooling applications? And, and so um, it was absolutely interesting to see that um, most of these uh, companies are interesting. They are monitoring everything. Some of those companies, especially from uh, since uh, we run this survey, uh, publicly announced that uh, they are, you know, partnering or 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 uh, getting into geothermal one way or another. But so as you can see, uh, for enhanced geothermal systems, um, more than 80% are you know, were interested, uh, more than 90% were interested in, in uh, um, uh, advanced geothermal systems. Um, reusing oil and gas uh, wells for, for geothermal was, was kind of split, probably that's because, you know, there are many things that uh, we still need to figure out. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure you, uh, uh, many of you already uh, learn about 
some of those challenges. Um, and direct heat applications, again, um, uh, strong interest, however, not, not as strong as for um, a high geothermal system and advanced geothermal system for, for power generation. Um, and so, and so it's, a, it's a great time for geothermal, no matter how you look at it. It's, it's a lot of excitement and, and uh, again, for uh, being an oil and gas professional um, and uh, um, um, learning more about geothermal, just I, I did in 20, since 2020, uh, there are absolutely uh, great, great opportunities for us um, out there. Um, so for the rest of uh, my talk today, another 20 minutes or so, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about direct air capture. And so uh, I chose direct air capture because it's an it's, uh, it's, uh, um, underlying you know, technology. Um, I'm, I'm going to describe it first, and then I'm going to explain why direct air capture and geothermal together. Um, and so most of of uh, the information I'm presenting here uh, is coming from, from uh, the project that uh, uh, Timur, Kivan and, and myself uh, ran last year and, uh, um, and on ongoing research uh, that we are performing now. And so uh, direct air capture in short is, is uh, are, are all the technologies is the approach of capturing the CO2 already in the atmosphere. Um, it's it's very uh, low density, uh, as you can imagine. It's no, not not uh, fluid gas. It's not uh, you know capturing CO2 from from uh, you know a power plant or from a cementing you know uh, plant. Uh, and so because of that, um, it's it's very low density. It's it depends on on the location. It depends uh, you know if you are closer to the seaside, for instance. It's uh, it's. Uh, um, it's, it's more dense than, you know, higher uh, in the mountains um, and, and things like that. Um, and as you can imagine, because it's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, not, not as dense, then it's really expensive and really uh, energy intensive to, to capture it. Um, however, um, Currently, uh, you know, there are different startups. Um, actually, they have a dark coalition, uh, direct air capture coalition, uh, with probably more than 20 startups right now, probably even, yeah, uh, probably 30 uh, around the world, uh, mostly in North America and Europe. Um, and so many of them have already different pilots, pilot projects going on, uh, mostly as I said, in North America, Canada, US, and Europe. Um, and they are capturing uh, around 0 0.01 uh, million tons of uh, CO2 per year. And it's a project in US being built uh, for 1 million tons um, of CO2 per year uh, in US. Uh, you should start uh, capturing, operating in 2024. Um, and so, um, however, in the International Energy Agency uh, net zero emissions uh, scenario, uh, by 2050, the, the direct air capture uh, technologies should be uh, scaled up to almost 60 million CO2 um, uh, tons per, per year uh, by 2050 by 2030 sorry um, and so now just to put this in perspective if you think about uh, uh, the geothermal heat pumps the direct heat applications for buildings that was more than 1 billion uh, 1.2 billion uh, tons of co2 equivalent right so and that was only in us this is actually global right so uh, even in the international energy agency uh, net zero emission scenario, it's a small, um, you know, it's a small quantity. Um, however, this doesn't take into account new technologies or new ways to reduce the energy needed for direct air capture. And so uh, here it's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, a visual representation of the international agency uh, energy agency scenarios for uh, uh, net zero emissions uh, uh, predictions, right? So even here, with without any new, you know, uh, technology significant technology uh, advancements, uh, we can see how big of a challenge will be to scale up the current, you know, um, 
uh, dark plants to whatever they predict by 2030. Uh, incredible, incredible exponential uh, growth. Um, so how CO2 is captured directly from atmosphere? And, and this is, uh, I'm going to explain why geothermal. So um, uh, currently two technological approaches are, are used for direct air capture. One uses uh, solid uh, solvents and another one uses uh, uh, liquid solvents. Um, for for the solid absorbents, uh, the temperature needed actually to capture the CO2 from, from the air uh, are between 80 and 120 Celsius degrees. And, and so this is exactly the match with the geothermal resources. Many actually oil and gas wells are within this range, right? Um, and if we want to drill new wells to capture, to bring, you know, geothermal heat to the surface to use it for uh, solid uh, uh, duct, um, uh, this can be done pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, for liquid duct, on the other hand, the temperature needed are much higher, between 300 and 900 C. And so at that point, um, at that point, actually, we need to talk about different kind of, uh, you know, providing that kind of heat. So, for instance, by burning, you know, fossil fuels, natural gas or coal, right? Um, geothermal probably is not enough because those kind of temperature will be absolutely, you know, on the high end. Um, wind and solar, the same thing. Uh, if we want to use them, we may need actually to use them for, for solid duck, just because both kind of temperatures will can be achieved much, much uh, easier with any renewable energy. But here is the is the problem with intermittency, right? So geothermal can provide that continuous 24 hour a day, uh, 24 hour a day, uh, you know, uh, heat versus wind and solar that that are dependent on, on weather. Um, and so, and so, uh, as as I mentioned um, here, the the main challenge is really the the cost um, uh, of of duck, right? So uh, it's it's a very energy intensive uh, uh, process because we need um, uh, we need uh, uh, you need uh, the CO two to be captured uh, at such a low density. Uh, from the air, uh, but it's not only the physical cost of how much dollars we need to, how many dollars we need to spend on on capturing the CO2. It's also the effect of providing the energy to capture the CO2. So that energy will come with itself with with um, a, a CO2, uh, you know, uh, with CO2 emissions. So at the end, it's, it's also the, the, the cost, but also the CO2 balance between whatever we need to put in to provide the energy to capture the CO2 from the air and then how much CO2 we can capture. Um, and so um, the International Energy Agency pr um, predicts that, you know, uh, the uh, cost for, um, capturing CO2 by duck uh, can drop, can fall below $100 uh, dollar per ton, US dollar per ton by 2030, but uh, uh, significant, um, you know, technology uh, development is needed. And so that's actually where the, the rest of my talk uh, is focusing on. What happens if we can use geothermal, which today is not used for, for DAC? What we can use it, uh, what uh, uh, happens if we can use it, what advantages uh, that bring, right? Um, and so when we talk about uh, um, geothermal and uh, solid DAC, uh, just because solid duct needs the same temperature that geothermal can provide anywhere in the world. Um, we run a thermoeconomical analysis uh, to figure out actually what exactly geothermal um, and, and solid duct would, would mean, right? So we are talking about the same temperature, uh, you know, overlap. We are talking about regions that have some kind of uh, uh, best cost analysis for both solid duct and geothermal. And that means on one hand, we can provide the, uh, produce the heat to the surface, but then we also need to have um, uh, the, you know, the, the highest density of, of duct, meaning, uh, meaning we have to be close to the, to the uh, sea level. And we also have to have the port space to capture the CO2 that, that uh, uh, to store the CO2 that we capture. And then the third criterion is really the tax incentives, right? So, so just like with uh, carbon uh, capture and storage, um, 
in US, for instance, the US 45-2 uh, regulations uh, maximize the tax credit for, for that for geological storage, right? So, so those are the, the, the main uh, criteria that we took into account when we, uh, we selected uh, our, our sites. When we did that, and, and we have a paper in the uh, geoenergy uh, science engineer that, uh, engineering that we published this year, when we, when we did that, we selected actually, uh, we narrow our search to four regions. We, we look at the Houston area, Texas Gulf Coast. We look at the Los Angeles Basin in California. We look at uh, Alaska's uh, Cook Inlet and also um, uh, a field, uh, Groningen field in, uh, in Netherlands. And so if you look uh, at all of them on the map, you, you, you quickly see that all of them actually uh, have the same kind of, um, um, they, they um, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, they uh, uh, have been selected according to the three criteria I talked earlier. Um, now, um, our analysis in this paper was specific to these four sites. And, and um, however, um, when we started to uh, deep, deeper into, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> identifying the, the geological maps, right? So for the heat flow, for the port space, for all the pipeline available, for the existing oil and gas wells, for new wells that can be drilled um, in those particular locations. What we figure out is that many places in the world do have uh, different kinds of maps, like this one I'm showing here, uh, the geothermal ability maps from, you know, for the US, for Alaska, for, um, you know, the entire world, um, for China, for Turkey, for Africa. Um, Europe has many countries with uh, maps like this. Australia has a map. So there are many, many maps that we can use. However, the biggest challenge is actually the scale or how accurate these maps are, um, the depth they go to, the pore space that we need to overlap with these geothermal maps, um, and so on and so forth. And actually, at this point, we really don't know of any map that can have everything together, right? So we manually had to go and look at all these maps, identify the sources of uh, uh, of data from different, you know, for different states, uh, for Texas, for California, for Alaska, and so on, and and figure out how we can extract that data, put it in in a in a, a standard format, and then uh, extract information from it. But but all those details are, are explained in the paper. What happened is actually um, after we run that kind of analysis, uh, we also propose a levelized cost of solid duck. Um, so uh, that includes different kind of, uh, you know, energy sources. So one is 100% uh, electric, another one is 100 from the grid, another one is using natural gas um, energy uh, for heat, and then another one using uh, geothermal uh, uh, heat directly, right? Um, and so we, we came up actually with, um, with a levelized cost of uh, solid duck uh, that we can compare these different regions. And then we also look, as I said earlier, about uh, we look for the carbon intensity uh, of the entire process. And so we look in the, again, the three scenarios for 100% electricity, natural gas, and geothermal um, for this uh, 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 four regions. We also look at uh, what it means if we, uh, if uh, existing oil and gas wells uh, can be, you know, um, uh, oil and gas wells can be used for for heat production, or we need new wells. And so that that goes into if we have the pipelines, for instance, uh, also for carbon sequestration. If we need new pipelines, uh, a lot of all those details are, are captured. Uh, uh, in, in in our model. And so long story short, these are just some snapshots of our results. Again, more, more results are, uh, are explained in the paper. Um, and, and so you can please ask me questions or, or uh, let's, let's talk after this uh, if you are interested to learn the details. But um, uh, as you can see here, pretty much uh, the 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 smallest levelized cost of uh, a solid dark using uh, geothermal is in Texas, as as you would expect, and so the lowest the the, the lowest carbon intensity uh, for for the process is is actually in LA, uh, with with um, uh, Texas um, following close and and the Netherlands. 
Um, and so that was just an initial study we performed. Then we took it uh, to the next step where exactly the same model we use for pretty much any place in the world where we wrote, uh, uh, Timur actually wrote this, uh, this Python uh, script that is available online now. It's open source, so anybody can go, can download it, can, can install it uh, and, and run it using their own data. And so what we did is, first of all, to develop a technoeconomical analysis for certain areas, um, develop the model, and then and then make it available, publicly available to everybody to use it freely and, and figure out actually this um, uh, approach. Solid uh, direct air capture using geothermal uh, heat. Uh, it's, a, it's a technology that can be used um, anywhere in the world, right? And so the user, just like on this screenshot, uh, can, can implement all the data. Uh, specific to the you know um, area of interest, and then uh, they can come up with uh, this kind of plots. Again, these are just informative, uh, in which we compare the levelized cost of duck with uh, the CO2 emission uh, intensity um, for for any location. And then uh, more than that, we can uh, the user can now run a sensitivity uh, calculation for pretty much all the parameters that uh, that are. Um, uh, using the model or the inputs, and then uh, the user can identify what parameters are the most important for that specific area. Um, so again, this is uh, this uh, study is just uh, uh, getting published now. It's going to uh, be presented at the first, the inaugural SP Energy Transition Symposium in August. I'm um, I'm I'm very proud. Again, uh, I'm a co-chair of that event with my colleague Simeon Eburi of Chevron, and I'm very proud that uh, you know SP is taking a leadership position into uh, the energy transition uh, narrative and and geothermal. Um, and so uh, I'm I'm running out of time. Uh, I think. Um, uh, in, in terms of conclusions, I, I hope that uh, you found this talk informative. It's it's a lot, a lot of things are, are now, you know, um, um, going in parallel in geothermal. Uh, and, and so uh, some other time I'll be happy to give you a, a presentation about uh, uh, direct heat applications using geothermal. It's a whole new area where I'm, I'm very passionate about. Um, regarding geo, uh, stay tuned. The negotiations with DOE are, are ongoing, but uh, um, uh, hopefully we, we can announce all the details soon. Uh, really, really excited, uh, exciting uh, news, exciting uh, uh, things are going to happen. And I'm absolutely uh, humble by, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the all the momentum that uh, Jamie Beard uh, and SPE and Geothermal Rise, uh, Rising are, uh, are gaining with the help funding from DOE. Uh, absolutely amazing story. Um, this is this is the geothermal anyway decade, um, and so and so there are many opportunities for uh, technology development and and deployment for both power generation and direct heat applications. Um, uh, at the moment, I think there are more than thirty uh, geothermal startups out there. Uh, within SP, actually, we started uh, to our geothermal technical section. We started a monthly webinar uh, of the startup uh, uh, geothermal startup community. So on June first, we had um, we have Sage Geothermal. Uh, now we are going to have Quays on June twenty second, and then. All the way to the to the beginning of uh, next year, we have a long list of of startups. Uh, please stay tuned. A lot of things are going on, and and I'm, I'm as I said, I'm 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 um, absolutely humbled by how many things are are going on. Um, in terms of dark and geothermal, um, so I talk about uh, a techno economical analysis. Uh, um, study that that uh, Timur, Kivan and, and I have run since uh, pretty much May 2022. Um, and so and so uh, you are more than welcome to read our two papers, but uh, um, at the very high level, actually, the questions that uh, I want to remind you why we did this uh, were uh, pretty much to uh, first of all to explain uh, does the use of geothermal resources within that range of 80 to 100 uh, uh, degrees Celsius uh, can lower the cost of solid dark. 
uh, and then um, how the cost of um, of uh, uh, solid dark uh, with geothermal uh, vary among regions. Um, in the example I told you in one of our papers, we ran for regions. Uh, now in the second paper, pretty much you know you can uh, anybody can implement the uh, the parameters, the inputs for any specific region in the world, and uh, and they can run um, the analysis. Um, and then uh, uh, another question, which is very important, in addition to the cost, is how much pore space is is um, out there, right, uh, for any specific uh, for the, uh, any specific uh, uh, site? Um, and so uh, uh, that's important not only for the physical pore space that will dictate uh, the capacity that uh, you know the CO2 can be captured and stored, but but also for for the cost of the project, and so. Here, if you think about it, when we talk about very large projects, we are thinking about you know capturing uh, CO2 from from a power plant and then cap uh, capturing and then storing you know millions of, of tons in only one location. But instead, in, in in terms of instead of thinking that way, is there an opportunity actually just to have micro micro you know uh, units to capture the carbon from air? Um, in low quantities and then and then store it, you know, either our uh, UR or uh, as a permanent store uh, uh, storage uh, option in, in certain locations, uh, much smaller locations, right? So um, it's, it's, it's the question now, the next step would be to figure out, um, do we need to talk only about large projects or we need to, you know, with all that many oil and gas that Produce heat in the 80 to 120 uh, uh, degrees range. Uh, is there any opportunity actually to have a lot of mini micro, you know, uh, duck plants, solid duck plants that can be economical um, just by scaling up their number and not uh, their individual capacity, right? Uh, that was the third question. And then the fourth question is um, what is the carbon intensity of solid duck with geothermal? Uh, depending on on the region, um, and so yes, um, after after this talk, uh, yeah, you can contact uh, Kivan, uh, uh, Timur, Kivan, or or myself about uh, our uh, our open source uh, model um, that that anybody can try it and and uh, figure out how we can uh, all um, uh, develop something together here. And with this, um, I'm just one minute uh, 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 into into the questions and answer period uh, i'll stop sharing my screen so i can take uh, um, questions so the first question is um, can you please talk more to the reason why focus effort on DAC when it appears that technologically and economically a simple geothermal energy convention um, Heating or direct electric can save CO2 from being emitting versus the uh, convoluted and more technologically risky and likely more expensive duck. This is a great question. I hope I hope uh, um, you could hear it. So um, what what happens is that this is not a question about uh, and or or. It's it's uh, it's about uh, uh, absolutely end right. So because we we are under time pressure here to lower our CO2 emissions while continuing with our economical progress, we cannot afford actually to follow only one technology at a time. So what we are pitching here is about is there an opportunity to continue with direct uh, heat applications. Uh, so. Uh, deploy as many geothermal heat pumps as possible and at the same time to develop dark technologies that we are already looking at already. Um, I'm not saying that you know the dark startups should become geothermal startups but what I'm saying is that how we can use the expertise actually with the geothermal startup expertise and work together to a common goal while everybody is doing at the same time whatever they are best at. Right. So to me, this is more about we are in the phase of developing everything we have available in a very short time. And this never been done before. 
And so um, I, I hope that answer uh, your question. Second question, achieving the required temperature is theoretically possible everywhere by going deeper, but how deep is too deep in terms of cost? Um, this is absolutely a great question. So there are many studies that many, I, I know several startups that are looking exactly at this. So this kind of question is pretty much the first question that somebody needs to ask um, about identifying their market, right? So identifying the cost of producing whatever heat you need will define your market and your strategy for technology development. And so, um, you know, for direct heat applications, for instance, uh, that's pretty well understood. Uh, here in Austin, you know, the local drillers are drilling to 300 feet only, no question asked. Uh, in Germany, for instance, there are this heat uh, uh, system uh, for, you know, entire villages that can go to up to 1000 meter uh, deep, right? Um, and so that kind of market analysis is absolutely needed. Uh, a startup like uh, Sage or Quays, for instance, will tell you that they are, are chasing, um, uh, you know, hot, dry rock. And so I, uh, I, I know that they are not the only one that are looking to drill, you know, to uh, 10 kilometers. Uh, and, and so looking at the cost of that, Probably the first thing for you to learn is to uh, go to the Forge Utah Forge website uh, and learn from the experience on what it means to drill at what depth and what's the cost for that. And I'm saying Utah Forge just because you know it's a U.S. Department of Energy funded project. Uh, it's the flagship enhanced geothermal system project, and and so the data is available um, on their website. The third question, um, I, um, uh, it's out there, it's a uh, thought-provoking presentation. Thanks. Considering that enhanced geothermal uh, system site construction itself is very capital intensive, adding a dark site is, uh, to this is even much more capital intensive. Um, have you discussed this with any operators who are willing to demonstrate a combined enhanced geothermal uh, EGS dark site. Uh, no, it's absolutely a great idea. I I would really like uh, uh, to do that. So um, yeah, by all means, if you have any suggestion here, please please contact me after this, and I'm more than happy to uh, to to connect um, with uh, with any company or or to try to um, define a collaborative uh, uh, consortium. Thank you. Another another question that I can I can think about here and and this ask uh, myself. So you know, um, really the presentation this presentation is is to uh, open you know um, the interest of as many colleagues as possible to start thinking about where we can have the quickest and the the the, the largest return on investment. Right. So we put our investment in time and money. And then we come up with something that can change the world, right? So, um, how how can we do that? Um, I we talk about power generation. Everybody is talking about that. I, I talk about you know I I discuss uh, a little bit uh, direct heat applications. I'm also proposing here direct air capture with with geothermal. Um, what other opportunities are there? So the next one, in my opinion, would be by far agriculture. Um, if we talk about you know greenhouses right um, with with uh, you know with with so many challenges on our planet we need we need to address actually um, our our food chain and so um, does it make sense to produce you know um, all our food on different continent and and bring it fresh um, you know to the table um, on other continents um, uh, yes and no. Um, what's what's the cost analysis of that, right? So instead, can we actually have greenhouses even in Canada, my country, which is famous for being very harsh uh, winters, but having a lot of water and and uh, and quite quite some you know good good sun quantity, right? Um, do we need actually to look at into those kind of applications? Uh, do we need actually to use geothermal for desalinization? Um, 
again, way slower, uh, quicker than and uh, um, you know largest return on investment. Um, always a great talk and very interesting topic using geothermal uh, strength. Thank you. Um, I recognize a, a former student of mine, so thank you very much for your comments. Um, direct use and and uh, solar. Uh, Sorry, that uh, the 80 to 120 uh, degree range is very achievable across many regions. From your recent papers, um, what do you see is the primary barrier for develop developing solid dark projects across the US? Uh, is it pore space, infrastructure development, carbon density, and atmosphere? Um, I would say all, all of the above, but most importantly, the fact that there is no startup actually currently looking into this and trying to make it a, 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 you know, a, a commercial uh, project. So, um, as I said, most of these uh, 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 duck startups, um, it's, it's easy to, as I said, they have a, 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 all together, they have a website um, with links to their companies. Just look uh, how much funding they require. It's, it's really capital intensive um, and very slow. Uh, developing actually a, a storage site requires, in terms of permitting and regulatory you know, issues, requires anywhere between three and 10 years. So it's, it's absolutely slow. Um, and so we need to look, as I said, from from the very high level to define actually the business case, what problem we are trying to solve for us. And not to start like, you know, in the past from the very bottom with, you know, the technology development, coming up with an idea, spending a lot of time doing fundamental research and figuring out after years of years of research, this may work because my theoretical model is telling me so. Um, I think at this point, just because we don't have time, we have to start, you know, from both directions, we we really have to start from the from the you know uh, top and look um, down and figure out what problem are we trying to solve, and then once we identify that, then we ask how are we going to solve it, and then look at what technologies are available out there and figuring out actually where we can take the lowest hanging fruit. Um, you know, the, the technologies that are mostly available with a technology level, uh, uh, leadership level uh, uh, very high, you know, six, seven, eight, and then uh, apply them to, to the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, great question. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, with this, I think uh, we are pretty much close to the end.